All right, so uh, I want to go back to, I watched some of this debate, Randall Rouser versus Matt Delahunty versus T-Jump versus the other guy, <laughs> Samuel, Samuel something, the other guy. Um, and I may have mentioned it once or twice in the video, but I want to go back to it for a little bit because there's something I want to discuss. Now, the debate is being framed as, is it rational to believe in God? Now, here is the really interesting question that needs to be asked. See, Matt Dillahunty will tell you the story of his deconversion, okay? And I've heard the story numerous times now. I'm pretty sure he offered it in this debate. Once upon a time, Matt Dillahunty, yeah, was a practicing Christian. Now, as a practicing Christian, he has reported out of his own mouth that he has had a low-resolution spiritual experience. So he has had spiritual experiences that at the time he thought was the Holy Ghost, Okay, looking back at it, at it now from 30 years past the event, as a practicing atheist, he looks back at that experience and goes, it, it was not the Holy Ghost, it was just my mind, but I had some sort of, you know, maybe I got something active in my brain chemistries and I had some sort of feeling in my fifis. So he looks back on that experience and he goes, I have had a, a, a spiritual experience and I did not believe it was God. Now, here's the part... That needs to, here's the part that, um, that we need to analyze further. So, him saying, I, Matt Dillahunty, have had an experience, has had a spiritual experience. As I've tried to point out, what he had 30 years ago was a low resolution spiritual experience, but it was not strong enough. Now, I've told you in other videos. It is from inside the spiritual experience, inside a powerful version of the spiritual experience that people come to believe that God exists. Why? If you've had the religious experience for yourself, you, you would know. Why? Because you have the experience, I'll tell you firsthand, and you go, hey, wait a minute, this does feel like God, and it's really convincing. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. But what I'm telling you is that there is such a thing as a low-resolution spiritual experience and such a thing as a powerful spiritual experience. And from inside a powerful spiritual experience, 85 to 90% of the people experience are going to go, hey, wait a minute, I really do think this is God. Why? Because it's really convincing and it really does legitimately feel like God. Now, we can still be wrong. But what you cannot do as an atheist as an atheist who is interested in the truth, is decide out of not outside of that experience what it is and what the ontology is. You can't. And furthermore, to take Matt Dillahunty's experience as our example, he hasn't really had a powerful enough one to decide one way or the other. So it would be the equivalent, um, Matt Dillahunty... 30 years ago, had two beers. Two beers one night. And his friends were all like, wow, you're really wasted, Matt. So in his own words, when he has talked about his spiritual experience, now this is his own words, this isn't me. He's explained this numerous times on numerous channels. And he said, I had what I thought at the time was an experience of the Holy Ghost. Why do you think it was an experience of the Holy Ghost? Because all of his friends said, wow, you're really on fire for the Lord tonight, Matt. All of his family said, wow, you were really on fire for the Lord last night, Matt. And his pastors all said, praise Jesus. The Holy Ghost is moving through you like nobody's business, Matt Delonte. You are on fire for God. Hallelujah, Matt Delonte. So his environment told him. And if you want to say he was indoctrinated, fine. He was indoctrinated. I don't care. Okay, whatever. He was indoctrinated. But his environment told him that experience you had was, the, was it. That was the real thing. You're now on fire for Jesus, Matt. And little young little Matt Dillahunt said, Hallelujah, I'm saved. But what I'm telling you from my own knowledge and practice of spiritual experiences is that he did not have a strong enough one to decide one way or the other. And furthermore, the most important thing to his deconversion was not the experience itself. The most important thing to his actually having deconverted and he, he'll tell the, still go on to tell the story. He goes off and joins the Navy. He starts reading up on different things. And he starts, you know, going out and experiencing the world. He comes back, and those same religious people who told him, you were on fire for the Lord, 
he now interacts with that group and he looks around and he says to, and he says to himself, wow, you guys ain't me. Some of this is politics, some of this is politics, some of this is politics. That's the most important thing that happened in his deconversion. All things being equal, the experience itself was not conclusive one way or the other, correct? We all agree with that. It was a small, low-resolution spiritual experience. All things being equal, if he had gone off to the Navy and come back and, those same, and, and had not found that group of people wanting... He probably did, did an inventory on him. He was probably correct. He probably said to himself, okay, you guys are kind of bigoted. You guys are kind of ignorant. You guys don't know anything about science. You know, you're narrow-minded. <laughs> he looked around and he was probably correct. You know, and said, you guys ain't me. I'm not interested in this club anymore. The experience itself was inconclusive one way or the other. But what was conclusive, he came back to join up with his f former crew and decided, this, you guys ain't where it's at. Who tells you a huge chunk of your epistemology is who is giving you the information? And how trustworthy do you find that source? And lo and behold, how trustworthy you're going to find that source is how much you identify with, this, with the source giver. If you go back from having joined the Navy for 10 years and you kind of miss those people, and those, pe you really, those people where you had the best years of your life and you met your favorite girl there and you really loved being a Christian, having nothing to do with the ontology of the experience itself. You ever, everyone understand what I'm talking about? And you went back and all things being equal, you loved that group of people and you felt like you belonged there and you identified with them. You're still a Christian. <laughs> Same experience. Same ontological reality. You are still a Christian. Why? Because you have not been given any sort of socio sociocultural reason to deconvert. Some of this is politics. That's the, just my best way of saying it. Some of this is politics. It's really complex when I'm actually trying to ferret out. Really, really, truly complex. That's why these imbecile conversations that we try to have on Twitter and stuff, where you just try to shut people down, are totally inauthentic to the type of thing we are talking about, to the actual phenomenon we are talking about, requires real thought and a real complicated thought process, and it requires you to, for you to be engaged fully and really thinking on all five cylinders on multiple different levels. Because what I just told you is the God's honest truth. God's honest truth. And if you just heard that, so you can go, okay, so God, your sky fairy doesn't exist, then go away. <laughs> okay, so see, it's not your sky fairy because blah, 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 and have some sort of complicated way to tell me, not in so many words, see, it can't be the sky fairy. You're wasting my time, you're wasting your time. You know, go prove your case to somebody else. Why? Because I ain't interested, and you shouldn't be interested in hearing yourself talk. Why? Because you're not all that interesting. <laughs> Do you understand what I just said? It's complicated, but thinking through it makes complete sense. Same person having the same low-resolution spiritual experience goes off to fight in the war. I don't know, what was he in the Navy? Were we at war then? When was he in the Navy? In the 80s and the 90s? We were at war with someone, weren't we? I don't know. We were invading something or other. Where did we invade? Greece. We are invading Greece, and Abdullah Hunty was part of the first wave of invasion force. Yeah, he met Dillahunty storm the beaches of Greece. You didn't know that? Well, now you know. <laughs> All right, so he goes off to join the Navy. All things being equal, if he were pining for that little small town and pining for that group of friends, and he had that one special girlfriend who really made him feel so warm inside because she was a loving Christian girl. You see how this all works? How the sociocultural ramif ramifications of your environment speak so clearly and actually carry what is most convincing about the ontological experience, as I've tried to explain in the past. There's a logical predicate for your belief. Atheists think that that's the whole story. It's very little of the story. It's maybe 5%, 10% of the story. And then there's the emotional resonance of the things that you believe, and that is the whole story. Some of this is politics, some of this is politics, some of this is politics. He came back from wherever he was in the Navy, in the Navy, you can sail the seven seas. <laughs> I don't know, it just occurred to me to sing, uh, what were those guys called, the village people? Yeah, it just occurred to me. I don't know, it felt, spun, felt right. <laughs> felt right in the moment. Why is that, Craig? I don't know, it just felt right. So he's in the Navy. And you can sail the seven seas in the Navy. You can put your mind at ease in the Navy.
Navy. So young little Matt Dillahunty is in the Navy. And he's in the process of deconverting. Why? Having nothing to do with the experience itself. He's becoming a different person. He's growing. That's what happens when you go off somewhere. That's why fundamentalists try to circle the wagons on your experience and try and tell you this is off limits, that's off limits. Why? Because deep down inside they know if you experience this and you experience that, you're going to grow, change, and you might not want to be in the club anymore. It's that simple. It's that simple. The club can even be right. And you can grow and change and become a different person and not want to be in the club anymore. That's what this is more about than anything else. I don't want to be in your club anymore, guys. Why? Because you're bigoted. You're narrow-minded. You believe stupid things. And then there's a process of justification, sometimes really, really fatuous, because some people experience guilt about that that they aren't expressing, so they make a, a complex series of justifications to explain it that don't really add up. I'm not saying that Matt Dillahunty experienced God and denied it. I'm saying he had a low-resolution spiritual experience that can't be decided one way or the other. Now, let's go into that for a minute, because I'll try to explain that. He had two beers when he was 15 years old, and his environment told him, you are wasted, Matt. You were, wow, you were, pla you were plastered last night. Matt, you were totally drunk. Oh, my God. So for five, ten years, he thinks he knows what it's like to be drunk. And he doesn't. Why? Because the lightweights he was hanging out with don't know what it's like to be drunk either. And actually the metaphor holds, if you're thinking of drunk in the Holy Spirit, it kind of holds. So the lightweights that he was hanging out with don't know what it's like to be drunk either. And for 15, 20 years, he's been thinking, that's what it's like. And now he's in a debate 30 years later with Randall Rouser, who was a practiced alcoholic, <laughs> who, was, who used to be an alcoholic. Telling him, you've never been wasted, man. He goes, don't you tell me I've never been wasted. There was that one time when I was 15 years old, I had those two beers. Woo! I was ripped, Holmes. I was ripped. And those of us who are actually drinkers, standing around shaking our heads. <laughs> the guy doesn't know anything about alcohol. Now, let's get, let's, let's get it back into the realm of the scientific. In other words, I, what I'm explaining, and this is non-negotiable, this is the actual God's honest truth. Doesn't prove that there's a God. But if you want to know that there's a God, you have to go to the source of where the God belief is being generated, and that is the religious experience itself. And if you want to know anything about that in any sort of meaningful, true way, you have to explore the religious experience in a way that is honest, consistent, and, you know, comports with reality. In other words, explore it on its own terms for what it actually is. So if you were going to study the experience, you have to be studying a powerful, high-resolution, intense religious experience because that's where people go, this really feels like God. Not these low-resolution, wussied-out religious experiences that their friends said, you were really on fire for the Lord. That's not where someone goes, I'm convinced that was God, and I'm going to take that convic conviction with me from now until the day I die. Nobody has a small resolution spiritual experience like Matt Dillahunty and, and, and goes, I know that was God. Nobody. The people who honestly believe they have had a, an encounter, a spiritual experience that they actually care about and they'll think about 10 years after the fact, irrespective, mind you, here's where it gets, excuse me, important irrespective of the socio cultural reality of their environment. In other words, I've had powerful enough religious experiences in my own life that I could go for 20 years with, with hostile environment. People telling me, you're crazy, Craig. It's a sky fairy, Craig. We hate you, Craig. <laughs> it's a sky fairy, Craig. It wasn't what you thought it was, Craig. I could, I could deal with that for 20 years by myself on an island with hostile people around me and still believe in the ontology of what I experienced. That's how real it was to me. My environment is not reinforcing or denying it at all. I'm choosing the environment that, you know, that where people believe the same thing that I believe. But if I were put in an environment where they weren't there, I would hold on to that belief come hell or high water. Why? Because I really honestly believe it was God. See the difference? That's the type of religious experience we are talking about when people are convinced it was actually God. Something that would actually be willing to practically die for. Not... 
ah, you know, that was probably God, but now looking back on it, it was, you know, could have been, could have been just Jesus Fifi. That's not an actually religious person. It's really not. <laughs> That's a kind of Christian, more a cultural Christian, who would have stayed a Christian where the sociocultural reality of Christianity more to his liking. I didn't say that all that clearly, but I think you kind of totally understand exactly what I mean. There are two types of religious experiences. Those that are really, really convincing to the one, the people who have them. And if we were a scientist to study whether that experience has an ontology, those are the only ones we'd study. Not the ones that people are, yeah, I guess suppose it was God, but looking back on it, John, John Steingrad from Hawk Nelson talks about those type of low resolution spiritual experiences too. I used to think people who were deconverted didn't have them at all. Now I've talked to a bunch of atheists who've had a bunch of them. They're just not convinced they're God. Okay, fair enough. But those aren't the type of spiritual experiences that actually turn people into, yes, I'm pretty sure that was God. So if you're going to study it as an actual ontological reality, something we want to find out if it's truly authentic, you got to go to the ones who are claiming, I was on fire and I mean it. And I'd be willing to stand on an island for 10 years saying it. Someone who's really convinced. Not someone who was kind of like, yeah, you know, I guess it was God, looking back at it. Could have been. That's what John Steingrad, that's Matt Dillon. It could have been, I guess. I'm not really sure. Now, as I've explained in the past, let me see if I have more time. As I've explained in the past, there is a science. A science. Not a Craig Reed feels it would be great if. Not a Craig Reed in his happy chamber prays and hopes and wishes there would be that there could be a path of understanding if a science to intensifying spiritual experience inside of different people, to turning up the heat on a low resolution spiritual experience so that it becomes a powerful and convincing spiritual experience. Now, it's perfectly legitimate for you to say, I've never felt that, Craig, I don't, I, so I'm going to stay unconvinced. Fair enough. Fair enough. But in order for you to actually study it and actually come to a conclusion that has any integrity or any validity or any reason we should listen to you at all, you have to go right to the source and you have to go to the powerful source. There is an engine that creates religious and it is the, relig the powerful religious experience. That is the real engine that creates the real religious art. And that's the source you've got to study if you're a legitimate scientist or a legitimate atheist who really, really is interested in the truth. Outside of the really powerful religious experience, everything else that's going on is totally irrelevant. Why? Because some of it is politics. Some of it is politics. Some of it is politics. Sociocultural realities. In a better world where Christianity wasn't, you know, <laughs> getting... getting pooped on all the time and disparaged all the time and, and there wasn't some sort of deep-seated cultural agenda, not, not fully realized, but definitely there underneath the surface, trying to tell people who go away to the Navy and have experiences, there was other things going on when he was in the Navy. And some of those things were political in nature or sociocultural in nature. And they were telling him, Christianity ain't where it's at, dude. Christianity ain't where it's at. And that had far more to do with him becoming convinced or not convinced than the actual experience itself. And if we want to really truly know anything about the experience itself, we got to only involve ourselves with high resolution, powerful spiritual experience where people are claiming signs, wonders, and miracles, where people are claiming to put their hands on the sick and they recover. We got to go to those type of religious experience and study those. And, as I've pointed out, there is a science, a science to intensifying those type of religious experiences so that they are more powerful, <clears throat> more compelling, and more real to the person experiencing. There is a science to that. A science. Not a good guessing game. Not a, you know, I, Craig, want to pray about it and hope that I can think of a way is there's an actual science, and there's a really big reason why there are some people in a church, and my experiences with church is only a handful, who are truly committed, on fire Christians, and the rest of them are just kind of whatever, <laughs> kind of there taking up space. Yeah, praising Jesus along with everybody else, but aren't really in the fight, don't really care all that much. Why? Because they haven't had that compelling, really truly compelling religious experience. 
They haven't. It's obvious. It's obvious from their behavior. Like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't prove that the religious experience is true. But you have to go to the people who are like, and I, the example I pointed out was Corey Ten Boom. Okay? Corey Ten Boom is, is your modern day apostle. Corey Ten Boom was willing to go to a concentration camp. Was willing to go to a concentration camp rather than deny what she thought God was calling her to do. Now that is someone who is truly committed to their religious beliefs. So much so that you would say, one, either A, that person, cray, 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 crazy lunatic, or that person is onto something really important and real, and I want a piece of that. Those are the only possible two options that I can see. Maybe there's other options. But those are the, those are the most obvious two, two, two decisions to be made. That person's crazy. Why would anybody go to, could be willing to go to, to, to uh, I forget where she wound up, it wasn't Auschwitz. You can look it up. There's a whole movie. There's a whole book. There's a whole series of stuff about her called The Hiding Place. A song even. You are my hiding place. <clears throat> you always something. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's a Christian song. I don't know if it's technically related to her, but the, the movie's called The Hiding Place. And it's about her life. Um, who's in it? Julie Harris. Interesting little footnote. I was in a play with Julie Harris. Yeah, <laughs> really weird footnote. Now, if you don't know who Julie Harris is, and probably most of you won't, she's, she's won the most Tony Awards of anybody ever. And uh, <clears throat> back in my acting days, it was the only professional theater I ever did. I played a, what I play? It was about Tolstoy's wife. And I was, uh, what was I, a soldier. I had a couple lines. And it was, I think that's the only professional thing. Ah, that's not the only professional thing I did. But that's the only, like, main stage was at a big th college theater production where um, there were actual celebrities uh, trucked in to play different characters. Philip Baker Hall was in the play. I used to pal, pal around with him. Is that his name? The old guy. I'll look it up. I don't think that's his name. Um, somebody somebody rel relatively well-known who was breaking into movies was actually in the play. Who was a cool guy. He was telling me he was about to be in... Uh, he was in... Um, he was in a bunch of these different movies. The one about smoking and... Uh, can't remember offhand. I'll have to think about it. But anyways, so she... The Hiding Place... She was in the movie The Hiding Place about Corey Ten Boom. Now, Corey Ten Boom was legitimately, you know, on fire with her religious convictions. Now, in an actual practicing Christian who is an admirable human being, you see that really true, deep religious convictions are extraordinarily powerful, and the idea that the person can't be shaken from them is not generally stated as an insult. She's immovable. She can't be dissuaded. That's something that most atheists say is a pejorative. Why, that Craig Reed is total cray-cray. You can't reason with him. Well, in this sense, it wasn't a pejorative at all. You can't reason with her. So she did what she thought was right, and what God called her to do, come hell or high water. Come hell or high water. To the point where she was willing to go to a concentration camp. Pretty sure she died there. Because she hid Jewish people in her, in Holland. That's how strong her convictions was. That's how strong she, was, she would say to herself, I am going to do what God would have me do, come hell or high water. Now that's an extraordinarily powerful religious belief. That's an extraordinarily powerful conviction. And if you want to know if there's any truth in religious belief, you've got to go to people like that. And those people are few and far between and hard to find. Those are the real people who will tell you if there's some real ontology going on. And as a general rule, those people are really inspiring. Now again, an atheist is going to, I can hear the wise and hybrid atheist already that doesn't prove that she's believing something real, Craig. I get that. I get that. I didn't say it does prove anything. But it is a lot more compelling you know, place to explore whether there is something real animating these people's beliefs or not. See, it's easy to go to the, to the crackpots. Easy. And matter of fact, that's what most atheists do. They go to the crackpots. Let's go, hey, let's go, let's go have another video with the crackpot. <laughs> let's, let's, go, let's go have Matt Powell on again. <laughs> you know, we, we got to do something about this. We got to really explore Christianity again. Yeah, let's have Matt Powell on stream on our channel again. Oh, well, you streamed on every time last week. Okay, well, let's do it two more times. 
That's a general rule. It's not going to teach you anything about religion. It's not going to teach you anything about the truth claims of Christianity. It's not going to teach you anything. And it isn't you investigating to try to learn or prove wrong. It's not you doing a legitimate investigation. It's you having a foregone conclusion and trying to reinforce it, period. Period. That's what it is. That's what it's always been. And that's a huge chunk of what goes on here in this space. Huge chunk of it. Let me reinforce what I already think is the case, you know, 50 times from, from now till Sunday. That's not actual exploration. That's not actually let me find anything out. That's not actually let me really do, you know, a thorough investigation of the truth claims of Christianity. It's really not. It's not even close. Um, so, anyways, I'll go into this in depth in other videos to come, as I've, you know, I've, I've talked about a lot of this stuff in the past. So there is a religious experience, and the people who are claim who get their beliefs from that religious experience are different because the, those experiences are generally speaking really, really powerful, and there is a science. A science, a repeatable way of turning up the heat on experiences like that so that the person has it, to the person having them, they become more vivid, more real, more inspiring, more life transforming. All of the things that you would associate with truly powerful religious experience. There's even a science to what, what happens when people report having truly powerful religious experiences. There are criteria. This has been studied. Most of you haven't looked at the studies. <laughs> this has been studied, and it will be studied in the future, and this will be known. So, um, for the long and the short of it, you know, what it means for this particular video, Matt Dillahunty had a low-resolution spiritual experience once upon a time long ago. Had he been involved in a group called Christians, a social, socio-political, some of this is politics, some of this is politics, socio-political, socio-cultural organization that he identified with and he liked their values and he liked what they were about, that low-resolution spiritual experience would have been enough to keep him in the fold. Would have been. Why? Because even if it wasn't all that convincing, he would have convinced himself that it was convincing. As it happens, he starts deconverting. Now he hangs out with a totally different group of, group of friends, totally pals around with a totally different group of people who tell him to, to define that experience a, di a completely different way, the opposite of how the group that he, he distanced himself from. And that has so much more to do with the, the interpretation than the actual experience itself. That's my point. And, and there's a really, really, really solidly good point being made on, in here. And I will flesh it out in videos to come. Because nobody, religions are not born from people having, you know, kind of, sort of, touchy-feely feelings about Jesus. Religions are born by Damascus Road experiences a la the Apostle Paul. Powerful, convincing ones. Not demanding that you choose that the guy really experienced something or he's crazy, but close enough that they demand some type of verdict on their believability. Do you see what I'm saying? Religions are not born from these, you know, oh, I was with my friends that night and I had a kind of sort of feeling of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. That's not what religions are born from. They're born from being knocked off a horse. Damascus Road experience. Even in the modern world is my point. Even with people claiming powerful religious beliefs today, you just got to kind of search it out a little. Koi Ten Boom is not some weird esoteric figure who's disappeared into history. She's an actual human being who was alive in the 40s with actual books being written about her. There's a lot of people like that. Those are the people atheists already should have been searching out. Why? Because if you genuinely want to know, you genuinely want to know, you go to the strongest possible witnesses. So those are already people that should have been in the atheist playlist and they should have already been searching for these names. These aren't names that, like, Koi Ten Boom is in some sort of really rare esoteric name. If you know anything about religion, she should have already been in your playlist somewhere along the way. You should have already started in the process of investigating. If you're truly investigating. If you're truly investigating. She should already be, she should already be someone you've heard of. So, there you have it, kids. 
there you have it, nice little pretty package. That is all for now. The mass is ended. Go in peace. Amen.